a couple of months ago, Terry said, hey, you ever been to the York County Veterans Breakfast on Veterans Day? And I said, no. He said, well, why don't you come by, just have a small chat. It's just a couple veterans, and we'll sit around and tell stories. <laughs> wow, um, an honor to be here, and what a great turnout. And I'll tell you, it just exemplifies York. Um, and really, really, truly special morning. Uh, so welcome to all the distinguished guests, the Gold Star Mothers, the veterans that are here today, their caregivers, family, and friends, because that really is a chat amongst friends here today. So Terry, again, thanks for the opportunity. What I'd like to do is talk about two local York, Pennsylvania veterans today. One I only met two years ago when I returned, when Ellen and I returned back to York, and the other one I've known for many years. Uh, the first is Ty King. Could we put his picture up there? So that's Ty, for those of you that don't know him, but Ty was a Air Force F-4 pilot who uh, flew over 100 missions in Vietnam and, among other awards, earned the Distinguished Flying Cross for acts of heroism while performing aerial flight. Specifically in his case, that was dodging multiple service-to-air missiles while taking out a bridge just to the northwest of Hanoi in February 1968. So for the Vietnam vets in here and the history buffs, you know that that January, February 1968 time frame, that was the Tet Offensive in Vietnam. So let's get to know Ty a little bit better by hearing a few of his stories in his words. If you could roll the film. When you first arrive in the theater after going to jungle school and those things, uh, you begin flying these missions. Well, some, you know, prior to that time and that thousand hours, no one ever shot at me. But I knew if I'm gonna be flying combat, somebody's probably gonna be shooting at me. And of course they did. Um, and so how are you gonna react? How are you gonna react when you are suddenly shot at? I see that my fuel is what's called bingo fuel, which is I shouldn't be there at that moment so far away from home and so far away from the good guys. Um, and uh, anyway, I realized I had a, mule, a fuel malfunction. So I immediately declared an emergency coming off, that, uh, coming off the target and was able to kick everything off that was hanging on my aircraft that I could get rid of, climbed up to 40 plus thousand feet and literally, uh, literally cruised, or, or kind of coasted down to reach a tanker who uh, had come up slightly over the border of North Vietnam from Laos. So I was, I was literally uh, working on fumes in my aircraft when I joined up to the tanker that morning and diverted to another base and got the airplane and my co-pilot back safely home. I got married while I was in the Air Force uh, and uh, had, a, uh, had a child. Um, actually, the day I left for service, the day for Vietnam. My uh, daughter was born uh, around 8.30 that morning, and I got on a plane and left at 10 o'clock that morning uh, to go to war. Not being able to turn around, knowing that that might be the one and only time I'd ever see her. There is an old quote by Mark Twain. You need to know the day you were born, and you need to know why. And the why for me is I realized early on in my life that helping others and doing for others um, is, is, is the right way of life. It's, and I was raised in a family, in an environment, in my hometown where values meant something. I think all of you, you answered why already. You served. And I think service is still something you and I continue to do and need to do for the balance of our lives. Pretty special guy. So following Vietnam, Ty continued his Air Force career with subsequent tours, standing nuclear alerts and flying strategic missions in Europe. Now, like most veterans, as he alluded to in his videos after his military service, he continued to serve in his community, our community. Ty started the business and 
helped other manufacturers by advocating for practices and tax reforms and policies that encouraged and promoted local businesses. So Ty King, today we stand and salute you. You make York proud. The next local veteran I'd like to celebrate is here with us today, Ludwig Facenhammer, our guest of honor. If you could show his picture. Who's got one looking like that at home, huh? 98 years young Lou. Everyone calls him Lou, but back in the day he was also known as King Ludwig, or the Blue Max, as Terry said earlier. Now, I've known Lou for about 20 years during my frequent trips back you know, to visit my, my parents. Um, but to be honest, I didn't really know his story until recently. And what a story it is. In short, born in Germany, immigrated to New York, enlisted in the Army right out of high school, fought in World War II. He served under General Patton and was at the Battle of Bulge. He earned the Purple Heart. Went to college, got commissioned, and Join the Special Forces. Give me the most elite fighters, he says. He fought in Korea, earned the Purple Heart, second one, and an Air Medal. Now that's a story in and of itself, because how does an Army grunt earn the Air Medal? It's a great story. An interesting story that many have. He fought in Vietnam multiple tours, and he earned his third Purple Heart. When you get home later today, Google him. He's not only mentioned in every single Special Forces book on Vietnam, he's the main feature. Let's get to know Lou a little bit better by hearing some of his stories in his words. I was getting ready to graduate from high school, and uh, the war was already on. And I was already registered, you know, in the draft. So five of us from the class said, the hell with this draft crap, let's go. The thing that people don't understand is, I was born in Munich. And we immigrated to the United States in 39, which was the greatest thing in the world, actually. I went through the war with the 702nd Tank Battalion, 80th Infantry Division, General Patton, 3rd Army. We used to ride with P-47 aircraft that resupplied us in different operations, you know? We flew out and resupplied the unit and then he said to me, he says, uh, sir, do you mind if we uh, do a little shooting and stuff? I said, hell no, that'd be fine. That'd be great, you know? So we did. We attacked someplace he knew and shot. But all of a sudden, boom, up through the back, he got hit right here. And the bullet went right out, you know what I mean, right through it. So here I am wondering how we're going to make this trip back home. So I put the first aid packet on him, and um, finally he got very weak and disoriented, you know, from losing so much blood. So anyway, he said to me, take over. Well, it was a stick. So I took over the stick. And we headed towards the air, air base, and uh, the poor guy was just going faster than I wanted him to, you know. So finally, the base was one, one mile from my base in Pleiku, two, two core. And uh, so I called in and I said, your pilot is wounded really bad. I'm taking over, I don't know what I'm doing, but here I come. So once I came, the tower took over, naturally. 
And I said, gee, thanks. And whoever you are, thank you, but tell me what to do. So they told me, and they talked me in. And I, I landed the thing, and they, the, all they said was, hey, you saved us a lot of money. <laughs> I volunteered to the Rangers. And from the Rangers, from that point on, my mentality was strictly special units. So like Ty, Lou continued to serve following his military service. And like Ty, unless you ask, you're not going to know his story. Because these humble heroes were, in their words, quote, simply defending the country that they love, unquote. No need to brag, because it was never, it was never about them. Lou, I'm not going to ask you to stand, but I am going to ask York to stand because we salute you. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this nation became what, is it, what it is today because of the efforts and sacrifices of its veterans because of veterans like all of you here today, and because of your families who continue to love and support you. Each one of you has a story, just like Ty and just like Lou. Tell your stories. It's vital that we pass our lessons, our history, to the next generation of Americans. Our sons and daughters must understand that the veterans that we honor today, you, are the embodiment of the spirit which has guided our nation for over 200 years. This spirit has and will continue to keep America free. Now I'm going to shift gears a little bit about, a little bit, because Terry asked me to talk about a movie that some of you may have seen this summer. And I'm doing this be, you know, to provide a little bit of behind the scenes into the Top Gun Maverick movie. It was filmed uh, during the time that I was um, uh, and my staff were, were in San Diego running Naval Air Forces, so we had a fairly close relationship with the making of the movie for about a two-year period. Uh, if you could roll the flick. In Top Gun Maverick, you're going to see real actors in the cockpit and the full capability of the airplane when you're watching the movie when you get up there. You have a new respect for fighter pilots. There's nothing like it. That's a kill. When I first found out that we had to be in jets, I was excited. Day time, baby. I didn't expect anything less because it's Tom Cruise. He does all of his stunts, so I expected us to have to do it too. But when it became real, I'm like, oh, I don't want to do this anymore. Oh, okay. One of my favorite analogies that some of the top end pilots have, it's like being strapped on to a dragon. I told everyone, if you're going to take this role, part of it is being in that F-18. I don't know how to do it any other way. Being in an F-18 is unreal. There's gonna be a lot of stuff that people see and go, no way they really did that. And we really did that. Tom said, I need this to happen at 30 feet above the ground. He was doing 480 knots, basically a 500 mile an hour race car. I've been doing this in these airplanes for a really long time, and I watch that and I go, wow, that's fantastic. I wanted to celebrate the fighter pilot. Watching them explore what we do. It's breathtaking. Um, there's nothing like it. The Navy and the Top Gun team. Oh, they're amazing. Pretty cool, huh? 
so uh, the scene I'll talk about is that low-level scene that you see with the F-18 about 30 feet and 500 knots or so. And uh, uh, one of the rules that we had set prior to the making of the, the movie was we weren't going to break any of our aviation rules. And so early on, there was a meeting between Tom, Jerry Bruckheimer, Tom Cruise, Jerry Bruckheimer, and Joe Kaczynski, who was the director with our staff. And he asked, hey, have you ever seen Lawrence of Arabia? And some of us had and some of us hasn't. He goes, well, there's, this, there's a, a scene where you see a dot on the horizon, and the dot's coming to you. And as it gets closer, you realize it's Lawrence on a, on a camel. And he says, well, I want that same scene, but I want it with an F-18 coming at you. OK, let me see what I can do about that. So uh, long story short, the only aviators, so there are, you know, most fleet pilots are minimum altitude for training is 100 feet. And so the Blue Angels are the only, you know, Navy units that are allowed to fly lower than that to be able to perform something like this. But the Blue Angels weren't flying the Super Hornet in 2019 when we were filming. They were flying the Legacy Hornet, and we needed the Super Hornet to be in this, uh, this picture. There was, however, one former Blue Angel who was training in the Super Hornet because the Blue Angels in two years were going to be transitioning into the Super Hornet. That's what they fly today. So I said, who is that guy? His name's Frank Walleye Weiser. I said, get him on the phone. So we called Walleye and said, hey, uh, I think I need you for a couple months to do some flying. He said, OK, sure. And that was him flying that scene. I'll never forget the day that they filmed it was being filmed in Fallon, Nevada at Bravo 20, which is a run-in line for one of our, our practice bombing ranges. And I said, hey, fly it at 50 feet. And after you get done, give me a call and tell, tell me how it went. So while he does the flight, they film it. He comes, lands, gives me a call. And I said, how'd it go? He says, eh. I said, eh. We aren't looking for eh. I go, <laughs> I said, what are you comfortable at? He says, I'm comfortable at 10 feet. I said, OK, fly to 20. And that's what he did, and that's what it looked like. So anyhow, uh, it was a heck of a, uh, of a uh, thing to be a part of. And, and I know here today we're talking about you know, real skirmishes and real action. And you can sit there and say, hey, that's not real. But I'll tell you, it realistically depicts naval aviation. And the scenes were flown by real naval aviators, who today, as we sit here, are deployed across the globe, in harm's way, defending our national interests and demonstrating to any and all potential adversaries that <laughs> today is not the day to mess with the USA. That's real. So in closing, our veterans, you, you represent the very best of America. I am honored and humbled to be in your presence and ask that as we go from this place today, we go with our heads held high, our spirits lifted, and with pride in our hearts for what we have done to preserve the land of the free and the home of the brave. God bless you all. God bless all who currently serve and their families, and God bless all American veterans who proudly and rightfully earned that title. Terry, thanks. Out of the park, Thanks a Thank you, sir.